as a uh, CMU uh, professor. Uh, so you know, she joined uh, CMU in 1999 as a, as a student, uh, and we've been through a lot since, since then, actually together, the personal lot. Starting as a student, you know, my first memory of C was actually with two bagmen. They were sitting uh, both in the back of the class during my uh, vision class on the Trafocor Saint Tensor, for those of you who remember this. And uh, they had the, an amazing clear uh, quote in the headlight, uh, you know, WTF moment. I will never forget. <laughs> what is that? And then we went on to, uh, he went on, sorry, to uh, work at the Intel lab. Uh, there was a project called the Quality of Life Technology Center, we did, which did nothing for quality of life. <laughs> <laughs> and then back to CNU as a faculty member and uh, going on with a string of amazing research, producing amazing uh, students, uh, and this is what he's going to uh, present uh, to us uh, uh, today. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank C uh, for all his uh, amazing work and for the past 18 years having uh, made the uh, Robotics Institute look good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, this is, uh, I, I think, one of the toughest talks for me to give, uh, so I'm, I apologize in advance if I'm a little off my game. Um, this is also my first RI seminar, um, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for attending it. Uh, and uh, you know, I was, I was telling a few people here that I, uh, I said goodbye to my uh, favorite crepe maker uh, on Craig Street this afternoon. And we both nearly sort of went into tears because we, we've known each other for so long. So uh, it's, a, it's a really tough moment for me. Um, CMU is the greatest place in the world to do robotics. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity um, that everybody has given me. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the work that I've done. Um, it's gonna be less, slightly less technical, but I'll try to pull in some technical uh, concepts into it. I'll uh, also give you a little bit of a retrospective on how I got to do what I got to do. I'm an old man now, so I get to retrospect. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm excited about this. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge my, my fantastic students. Uh, it, you know, one of the greatest pleasures of being a professor is working with brilliant students and, and teaching classes. It's something that I've really enjoyed all through. And uh, each one of these students has a, a story to tell. Uh, and today I'm going to give you a brief vignette into one or two of these stories. Uh, I wish I could stay here uh, for several hours and tell you about each of their amazing works, but I'll just uh, briefly talk about um, just one or two of their works. But, but again, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to my students for being so amazing. Um, if there's one thing that I do, it's, uh, it's manipulation. That's all I do. Uh, my goal is to get robots to physically and forcefully interact with the world, pick up objects, uh, clear a table, diffuse bombs, and, and pretty much all of my life's research has revolved around doing this uh, for, for over half my life. Uh, and uh, it's, it's particularly exciting for me because it allows us to not only develop fundamental algorithms that, that tell us something about uh, how mathematics works, but also to implement that, them on real physical systems and, and to tell us a little bit about how people work. Uh, I, I'm, I'm cursed with this, uh, with, with this feeling that every time I watch my children perform manipulation tasks, I'm always wondering, like, is that grasp really in force closure? I don't think so. <laughs> and, and surely it isn't. Or like, is that the best, like the most, most effective way to manipulate that, uh, that block? Uh, but sort of, um, it, it's both uh, an, an ability and a, to evaluate the strategies that we develop mathematically, but also an ability to understand who we are as people. You know, as humans, we're the world's best at manipulating things, and, and my goal is to enable robots to do that. Uh, here's a brief, brief sort of vignette of, uh, of some of our work. Uh, this is Herb. Uh, which many of you have seen and known. And, and here he is performing one of the most important tasks uh, a robot should ever uh, perform, which is separating the cookie from the cream of, uh, of an Oreo. Uh, this was a, uh, a, a commercial that we shot for Oreo. Uh, they called me two weeks before the, uh, uh, this video was shot and said, we want you to separate the cookie and the cream from an Oreo. 
Uh, and we said, sure, why not? Uh, what's interesting and important here is that we decided to do this uh, as we are scientists completely algorithmically. So we built an Oreo detector. We built algorithms for motion plotting and uh, manipulating Oreos. Uh, we, we had some interesting sort of compliant control algorithms that we were performing because every Oreo is different. You know, every single Oreo is different. Some are fat, some are thin. Uh, but more than uh, a testament to our ability to separate cookies from creams, I think what this is is a testament to the generality of the algorithms that we've been developing for manipulation. When we built Herb, uh, we never knew that we would be manipulating Oreos. Um, at least I didn't. Uh, and, and when you think about it, the Oreo is really the most delicate and, and, and most um, uh, sort of smallest object that we have ever manipulated. And you can see we're doing some fairly intricate manipulation tasks here with this robot. So I think that sort of captures what we're trying to do. First of all, we're trying to build end-to-end um, -end systems that can perceive the world, build mathematical models of, of how the robot should interact with, with the world, and actually affect them in the real world. Uh, and uh, also uh, to develop general purpose algorithms. We want to seek generality in what we're doing, uh, such that we don't have to write a new algorithm every time we encounter a new object. So today I'll talk a little bit about some of the algorithms that went into this video, uh, as well as several other things that we've done. So um, uh, this is a very uh, iconic picture to, to many of us. Uh, this is a picture of um, you know, Gary Kasparov playing uh, Deep Blue. Uh, this is very iconic for me uh, when I was growing up because this is when uh, little Sid uh, saw that a, 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 a robot could beat a human at a game that was devised by humans. Right? Uh, and, and so I went on and, and, and wrote my own really crappy chess playing algorithms that, that lost. Uh, but it gave me uh, a lot of insight into and, and inspired me to write algorithms. Right? Uh, but I think this is particularly evocative for another reason, um, which I only learned in retrospect. Uh, here's the a, a robot that can beat the best chess player in the world at chess, uh, but yet it needs a human to move its pieces. Uh, and so maybe, just maybe, the hardest thing about playing chess is not thinking 10, 20, 50, 100 moves ahead, but actually picking up those, those chess pieces. Uh, of course, it's a very biased personal view since that's pretty much all I do. Uh, but I think it also, it sort of tells us a little bit about complexity, right? I think much of my work has really been on trying to bring about this reconciliation, uh, a reconciliation between what robots and systems are really good at, which is sort of geometric search in sort of beautiful, clean environments, and what they ought to be good at, which is to work in the sort of nitty gritty physical world with friction and forces. And a lot of my work really is about trying to bring about this reconciliation between what robots can do now and what robots really ought to be able to do in the future. Uh, I think the other point I want to make is that, you know, I said I work on, on manipulation, but really, uh, when you are performing manipulation tasks in a real world, then you are manipulating with and around people, right? Um, you know, people are an essential and important part of all of the environments that we're looking at. And, um, you know, current robots, essentially, most current robots, treat humans as obstacles that need to be avoided at best. Uh, and, and a lot of my subsequent work has been on trying to see if we can build mathematical models of how humans and robots can interact with each other. So sort of my favorite example is this. This is Jacques Pepin, uh, one of my favorite chefs. I watch all of his shows on PBS. And I'd like to be able to, and this is him cooking with his daughter, and then later he cooks with his granddaughter. Uh, but I would like to be able to enable a robot and a human to work closely together like this. I don't want it to be a case when, when I enter uh, the kitchen and I'm cooking and then my robot enters the kitchen, I have to leave the kitchen, otherwise you know, terrifying things might happen. I, I want the human and the robot to interact in a seamless way. You know, Human-robot collaboration is a dance and I want robots to be able to participate in this dialogue and this dance just like humans do when we interact with each other. So 
this has been another sort of recent and, and sort of very fruitful focus of my work, which is to try and, again, bring about another reconciliation between optimal control and lately game theoretic algorithms uh, to describe how humans can interact with humans or humans can interact with robots, and actually implementing them uh, on, on real physical systems such that we can try to take some of the wonderful qualitative ideas in human-robot interaction uh, and in cognitive psychology and apply sort of Bayesian reasoning and trajectory optimization uh, such that robots can perform these analyses automatically by themselves. Um, here's a, actually a very simple and, and kind of neat example of this. This is some of our work on legibility, and this is particularly work on deception. What we're trying to do is to convince that little girl that uh, we're trying to pick up the bottle on, on, on her right. And, and so she uh, sort of steals that bottle from the robot, but really the robot is tricking her. Uh, and going after the other bottle. Of course, this seems trivial for us in retrospect, but really what this came out of was a, an emergent algorithm that came about where we were predicting the in, and, and inferring the intentions of the human and creating an algorithm by, by a trajectory optimization that would you know, in its cost function, has this ability to maximize the probability of the thing that the human was not going to go after. So this is deception uh, formalized mathematically. Um, what, again, was really exciting about this work was, you know, we wrote the cost function, we took the functional gradient, and, and we enacted it on a robot. And not only did it, do, did it do its job, people were tricked, but it also produced sort of human interpretable motion. So we were able to, in some ways, capture, we feel, capture the essence of what it means to be legible, to deceive in a, in a sort of in a mathematical bottle that could be used and reused by, by a robot. So today, I'm going to focus really only on the top part. Uh, on manipulation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about sort of a large amount of work that we've done in human-robot collaboration. And specifically in manipulation, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is physics-based manipulation, uh, enabling robots to use physics to solve problems. Um, my own sort of personal interest in this uh, started when I um, started my, my PhD. This is in 99, right when I was taking Marshall's vision class and um, and, and learning about stuff. <laughs> and, but <laughs> I won't go any further than that. <laughs> but um, I, so this is a robot that I built in my first semester. Uh, this is the Mobipilator. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a robot that moves a piece of paper uh, using its wheels. Uh, this came about because I had my first meeting with my advisors. Are they here? Maybe not. Okay. Uh, and I, I said, little Sid said, what should I work on? And, and Mike Erdman, who was one of my advisors, said, find the hardest problem that no one has ever solved and solve it. And I was like, that is the most useless piece of advice I've ever gotten. <laughs> like, well, no, no, really, what should I do? And then Matt Mason, my other advisor, said, you know what, Sid, you should get a robot to move paper. And I was like, this is even more stupid than the previous piece of advice. <laughs> but fine, I'll do it. You know, whatever. And so this happened. Uh, and so I, uh, uh, what was really exciting about this particular robot, of course, we wrote a bunch of papers about it, is that uh, we were <clears throat> using the wheels not just to locomote, but also manipulate. So the robot is using its wheels right here to parallel park a piece of paper, right? Just like a robot can parallel park itself, it's parallel parking that piece of paper. And because paper is really light, it can do it super fast. Uh, and, and, and this is uh, really exciting for us because it was the, the, one of the first sort of works that tried to explore this duality between locomotion and manipulation. The idea is that when you're locomoting, you really are manipulating the Earth, right? And this has been a concept that's been thrown around quite a bit. But we were trying to formalize that by saying, I'm going to take a robot that has no hands and only legs or wheels, and I'm going to try to get it to perform manipulation tasks. 
Uh, so this is really exciting for me, and it introduced me to the world of what we call non-prehensile manipulation, being able to manipulate without using hands. We do this all the time, right? Uh, both in our lives, while playing soccer, while playing games, but even when we are pushing, pulling, and sliding things around, rarely do we actually pick up stuff. Actually picking up stuff is very, very rare. Uh, if you're, you're making breakfast or eating a meal, right, you rarely do actually pick up stuff, but yet robots are so, so focused on picking up stuff, like grasping, force, quality, metrics, and all of that. And so it was really befuddling to me uh, why people had not worked more on this idea of sort of non-prehensile manipulation and I decided that that was a thing that I liked, and I'll, I'll try to explore that. Towards the end of my thesis, I, have, I, I started thinking a little bit more about physics. So this is a paper I wrote with uh, Jim McCann who, and, and Nancy Pollard right when I was finishing up my PhD thesis on physics-based motion retiming. Uh, this is my first vignette into manipulating physics. So, uh, it's hard to see here, but this is the first snippet is a video of, it's a motion capture video of somebody jumping, right? And we take that video and we want to ask the question, can we retime the video? So think of a video as just frames and you're retiming it by turning a crank and making the video go faster or slower. Can we retime the video to make you feel like the system is on the moon, the person is jumping on the moon, or the person has twice the mass or the weight, right? So how do we manipulate the timing of a motion to convince a user to believe that uh, the system was actually performing something that it was not able to perform, right? So for example, you could take motion capture of me jumping and, and put it on Shrek, who is you know, much larger and, and more different from me. And uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, this was actually my first window into manipulating physics, right? I, you know, this is a way by which, uh, you know, the, the math on it is, is fairly complicated, but we were actually in the end able to build a real time system that, uh, that was able to take one single motion capture sequence and manipulate timing, manipulate physics to create all kinds of interesting behavior. And so this got me super interested about physics, and I thought I should, I should somehow find ways to combine in physics and non-prehensile manipulation. Uh, and, and so after that, I um, uh, became a professor and, and started working on, this is the DARPA RMS challenge. I know many people here are veterans of this. Um, it was a challenge where DARPA gave people a bunch of arms that sort of worked uh, and told them to do absurd things with them with a very, very short time frame. And uh, this is very, very much like what DARPA likes people to do. But uh, this particular video was actually particularly interesting for me because uh, you notice how the robot can't pick up that that rock, but what it's doing is that it's producing this sort of open loop sweeping action where it's pushing the, well, pulling the, the rock close to itself, right? This is a completely open loop action, and more importantly, it's both non-prehensile, it's not using its hands to pick it up because it can't pick it up, and it's using physics. It's sort of using physics to funnel uncertainty into sort of a much smaller region such that it can see what it's doing. We do this all the time again. When something is far away from us, we sort of pull it close to us before we lift it. And the question that, and, and this was completely hand-coded. It's like we totally hacked this and we completely hand-coded this. But this started a, a, a thought in my head about how can we automate this, right? Um, humans do this all the time. We're pushing, pulling, and sliding objects around. But how can we enable a robot to come up with such behavior complete, completely autonomously? And the, the sort of fundamental idea here is something that you know, many of us find very, very intuitive, which is to sort of harness the mechanics of manipulation, harness physics to funnel uncertainty. You know, when, uh, and, 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 and part of it is this notion that if I wanted to know exactly what the Z location of this uh, plastic glass is, uh, I could either use a very expensive sensor to measure it, or I could just put it on the table, and then I know that it's at the height of the table. So the interesting bit here is that it's not just observations, but our actions also that can reduce uncertainty. And here's a completely open loop action that's able to funnel uncertainty into your hand. Again, we do this all the time. When you reach for a glass or a coffee mug that's in front of you, you're curling your hands around it. Of course, you're using some tactile data, but even if you didn't, you're sort of reducing uncertainty via physics. 
And the first question you want to ask is, well, how can I model this? Right? Uh, clearly, there's an a underlying hybrid dynamical system that's working. How do I actually go about modeling it? And we actually searched into the physics literature, and there's some very, very elegant work, both by Matt in his PhD thesis back in the day, but also by some uh, physicists on what's called uh, quasi-static pushing. Um, quasi-static pushing is an assumption. Uh, it's not always true. It's an approximation of how the world works. Essentially, it says that the object stops moving as soon as you stop pushing it. So this is very, very true for a lot of objects in front of you. You can experiment with things in front of you. This is also very not true for many objects. So if it's a ball, if you push the ball, it's going to keep rolling. So this is a, an approximation of physics, but somewhat legitimate. One of the interesting aspects of quasi-static uh, physics is that you can compute an analytical solution to the forward model. Right? So you can, you can push it forward in order one, which is really, really nice because then you can simulate tens of thousands of forward hallucinations very, very quickly. So this is an approximation of, of real physics, but allows us to compute uh, potential solutions really quickly. This is a, a particular approximation that I like because in, in our experience, most real world objects that are sort of sitting on your table mostly actually adhere to this quasi-static pushing model. Of course, when a bartender like tosses a whatever they toss at you and you grab hold of it, that's clearly not satisfying quasi-static physics, but most objects in the world actually do, which is, which is nice. So one other nice uh, property of quasi-static physics is that you can actually analytically compute bounds on the requirements on your physics model. So you can say, I don't particularly care about the object mass or the object surface friction, but you can actually conservatively pick things like the pressure distribution and the finger object friction, things that are actually fairly hard to compute. So this gives us a nice uh, model. What can you do with this model? You can analytically forward simulate this model and forward propagate it to compute what are called capture regions. It's like, what's a capture region? Essentially, a capture region says that if I have this, that bottle, it says anywhere, if I place the bottle anywhere in this sort of hammerhead shaped uh, object, uh, this level set, I will be able to grasp it, right? So think of a capture region as an open loop stable policy that takes uh, this set as its pre-image and produces as its um, solution a single sort of grasp pose. Right? The, one of the nice things about it is that this pre-image can be computed analytically. So for every hand object pair, you can compute this analytically as your hand moves. You can compute it really, really fast. Right? So this, this, this can also be computed for sort of objects in AC2, not just x and y, but also x, y, theta. So one way to think about this is that it gives you the ability to create a net, right? So what's happening is that your vision system says, hey, here's where I think the object is. You have an uncertainty about where your, vision, where your object really is because you know, vision systems are still a work in progress. And what you're trying to do is to build a capture region that is able to encompass your uncertainty, right? So you're trying to build the smallest possible net that you can throw on your object such that it covers the uncertainty of the object that you might have, right? And so you can, you can search through this very, very quickly because you're able to produce analytical models and, and solve this problem. So what does this look like when you put it on a real robot? This is uh, old Herb from 2007. And what the robot ends up doing is, unsurprisingly, because it has an uncertainty model of how the object moves, it's able to harness this uncertainty to do things like uh, you know, settling the object against the edge of the table before grasping it, or funneling uncertainty such that it can actually get it into a state where it can be grasped. Um, we actually found this particularly useful. Here's another sort of really, uh, to me, wonderful example of push grasping. So here, this is the infamous lug nut from uh, the DARPA RMS project. And this is one of the cases where a push grasp actually works incredibly well, right? So what's happening here is that the robot is able to use its fingers, sort of manipulate its fingers so that it can turn them into a funnel, right? And, and push them in such a way that it's able to get all the uncertainty of that lug nut and actually grasp it. This is particularly rewarding because uh, we're able to harness physics uh, in a fairly uh, mathematically principled way uh, such that the robot can automatically come up with behaviors that actually 
uh, make sense and are actually useful for real systems, right? Um, and so this is something that we were really excited about. So sort of a first step towards trying to harness physics to solve problems. Um, but you know, I definitely want to talk about limitations and, and, and what, what took us to the next step. Uh, there were a lot of people who sort of followed up on this work. This, this, this work was, uh, I think, particularly useful in that not only did it show that the robot could do useful things, but it also enabled a framework such that others could sort of take it up and, uh, and, and work harder on it. Uh, but many of the limitations of our work were, first of all, uh, we were sort of very restricted to single object interaction. We could only push one object at a time because our quasi-static pushing model could only deal with a, a hand and one object. Uh, we had contact limited to just the end effector. So, the, the, so it was only the hand that could push objects, not other parts of the body. And we had fairly carefully coded motion primitives. So our push graph basically said you can only push forward. You can twirl the object and, and pick it up. And, and I wanted to sort of relax that a lot more. And so the question was, uh, how can you free yourself from all of these, these constraints that we have of, of having to deal with picking up the object with just the hand and manipulating it with just the hand? And, um, Good fortune, we were actually able to do it. So here's uh, an example of the robot using its entire arm to manipulate objects on a table. So we're doing whole arm, non-prehensile manipulation, interacting with multiple objects um, on the fly. Right? And, and this is particularly exciting because, so here the ro robot is actually using its elbow to push the white box forward, all completely deliberately. Right? It is. It is deliberately interacting with the world such that it can solve these problems. So it's, it's treating clutter not just as something that needs to be avoided, but sort of fearlessly reconfiguring everything that comes in the way of its primary task. And, and being able to do this sort of completely autonomously. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we're able to do this. And I'll also talk a little bit about uh, some of the limitations of this work. Uh, but that's, this is something that was really encouraging us, to us because we were able to free some of the limitations uh, that we had of push grasping to something that was fairly general and, and worked on the whole arm. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them anytime. Oh. Chris, nothing? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to miss you, Chris. <laughs> Hi. So uh, one, of my, one of my favorite things about giving a talk at CMU is, is to battle Chris. I've been battling him for 18 years now, and I, I'm going to miss that. I'll, I'll have a little like Chris effigy somewhere and, uh, <laughs> and channel you. I'll send you a voodoo doll. <laughs> um, so rearrangement planning. So uh, one of the nice things about this framework also was that we were able to crisply define the problem we were trying to solve. Right? I, I think that part of being a scientist is not just to provide answers, but also provide clear statements of what questions you're trying to solve. And in, in trying to explore this problem that we, we knew in the back of our mind we had a some somewhat vague solution for, we were actually able to come up with a better formalism of the problem statement itself, which was actually really beneficial to a lot of people who followed uh, us on our work. So this is the rearrangement planning problem, right? Uh, we have a robot, yay, which is a thing that can move stuff. Uh, we have a bunch of obstacles. These are obstacles that are immovable, like the table or walls. We are also endowed uh, with um, movable objects. These are objects that can be moved via physics, right? So you can push, pull, slide, topple, do whatever you want with them. And our goal is essentially to push the goal object uh, to the gold region, right? We have a goal object, we'd like to push it to the gold region. We don't particularly care about anything else, right? So this is a, a, a problem where there's a, uh, the goal itself is underspecified. We don't care about where the clutter is, we just want the goal object to be in the gold region. And so uh, you can work with a, with a state space that really is the cross product space of the robot and all the movable objects, right? That's fairly straightforward. Uh, we have the robot, we have all the movable objects. We have an action space, which is, let's assume, the set of velocity twists that you can apply to your robot, the way you move your robot, applied to a certain duration. And this could be sort of low level controls applied for a certain duration. And we have physics. Uh, this is the most annoying part because every time you exert a, a control on your world, it's going to move in some funky, nonlinear, hybrid way. Right? 
If only it moved straight, then the problem would be easy. But when you push stuff, it doesn't move straight. It moves in weird ways. That's been sort of the bane of our existence. And so it moves with this non-prehensile interaction that's actually fairly complicated to model. Right? So actually, running like real rollouts with real physics is, is incredibly complicated. And what we like to do is uh, you know, to find a solution. So one, one big challenge, of course, is like how do we incorporate whole arm interactions with multiple objects, right? We want to we wanna be able to do that. We want to be able to use the entire arm to move things around. And we want to be able to push multiple objects. And, and, and one of our sort of key insights was to integrate sort of physics models, these sort of quasi-static physics models that we have, and to cobble them together in such a way that we could integrate them into the core of uh, randomized planning algorithms. The reason we chose randomized planning algorithms was because they allowed us to uh, sort of reasonably intelligently uh, trade off between optimality and speed. Right? It produces randomized algorithms, produce um, reasonably reasonable solutions quickly. And if you give them enough time via identification or via other strategies, they, they provide you better solutions subsequently. So they're somewhat any time in their behavior, give you something fast, and then improve it and refine it over time. Right? So you can, they have some reasonable properties. So here's a straw man algorithm. Essentially, uh, you're growing a tree from your start, where each node is uh, a a configuration in this cross product space that you're looking at. So you're growing, you know, it's like what you do with uh, a rapidly exploring random tree, Monte Carlo tree search, it's just doing a tree search. Um, and every edge is a, an actual sort of rollout, right? So these rollouts are somewhat expensive. Now, uh, you can hallucinate a new place where you want to be. Uh, so let's say you're randomly exploring the space, you hallucinate a new, new point where you'd like to be. Uh, you find the nearest neighbor in your tree. Of course, defining what a nearest neighbor is in a non-Euclidean, uh, moderately complicated space is non-trivial. Uh, we've done a bunch of things on it, including uh, learning distance metrics based on performance. That's a, it's actually something that was very successful for us. But imagine you're endowed, uh, you know, you're sitting in some Riemannian space, so you have some metric structure that's, that's given to you. And now you'd like to connect this point to that point, right? That way you grow your tree. Of course, one of the challenges with having really complicated physics is that you don't have an analytical solution to the two-point boundary value problem. You just can't connect because it doesn't move in a straight line. If you push, it moves in some weird, crazy way, right? So how do you solve this? One of the nice things about tree-based methods is that you can solve it approximately using what's called a shooting method. So the shooting method essentially says, I'm going to, I would like to go there, but instead what I'm going to do is to sample uh, somewhat intelligently a whole bunch of different solutions that are possible. So I'm, I'm shooting myself towards the goal with various controls, and I'm just going to pick the solution that gets me the closest to my target point, right? So of course, you have to think very, very deeply about what it means to be close, how to do better in this search, uh, how to actually guarantee coverage. If your shooting method is biased, then you may never actually cover the entire space. You have to think very, very carefully about that. And if you can prove certain properties of the system, like small time local controllability, which we're able to prove, then you can get some reasonable theoretical guarantees that this shooting method sort of works. It sort of works in practice too, which is nice. Uh, always nice. And then essentially you keep going until you reach your goal and or reach close enough to your goal. And once you reach your goal, then you can trace back all of your back pointers and you end up with a path. And that path sort of looks like that, right? So you've been able to cobble together solutions such that you get to your, your destination. Uh, the nice thing about these tree-based methods is that because there's no loop, you're not creating any loops. You don't need to analytically solve the two-point boundary value problem because you never need to loop. You can only be approximate. Of course, you'll get a, a solution quickly, and you can improve and refine that solution over time. Um, I am I am sort of uh, bypassing about six years of research we had to do to actually get this to work, and and to prove that this actually worked. Uh, but that's sort of the the general gist of of, of what's happening. Um, and, and so that, that, that challenge is something that we were able to moderately solve. Uh, you know, our planning time was in the order of seconds, which was, at that time, faster than most other algorithms that was out there. Uh, and as computers got faster, it got better for us. Uh, but I think uh, the other big challenge was, um, you know, how do we make it actually fast, right? Um, and this is, um, 
you know, it's, it's a problem where you're working in this fairly large cross-product space, and you have to think about how you can actually speed up the search in this, in this space. I'm going to talk about one, one trick that we used, which is somewhat pragmatic, uh, which is the idea to actually project actions onto what we call a lower dimensional physics manifold. What's the idea here? If you wanted to reconfigure a bunch of objects on a table, you could pick one object up, toss it up in the air, move a bunch of the other objects around, grab it, and put it back on the table. That would be cool. I, I, I wish I could do that. Um, but if you think about the action space that you're looking at, then it is very large. It's really large. And so although our robot might be able to come up with such a strategy, it would take it hours, perhaps days, perhaps never, to actually produce that strategy. So the question that we want to ask is, if we believe that we are quasi-static, how do we restrict the, the dimensionality of the search space itself such that we can get reasonable solutions quickly? And our key insight was, well, I'm going to restrict the robot to only perform interactions on the table. So no picking stuff up, no throwing stuff up. I'm just going to let you move sort of on the table and, and, and allow you to perform quasi-static physics on the table. Right? So this hugely reduces the things you can do. You can't push, you can't push it you know, away from you and grab it on the other side and throw it up and catch it. But it certainly allows you to come up with a restricted set of solutions. So the, the, the sort of constraint we said was you can do whatever you want, but you can only push it on the table. Right? So think of your, yourself as reaching into a fridge with a sort of a narrow uh, ability to like, move around and pushing, pulling, and sliding things around so that you can grab the thing that you want to grab. So every time you look at this video, think of it as this like, eight centimeters above this, there's this glass plate that prevents you from just picking that damn thing up. So that's what's happening. Of course, one of the beautiful things about running these algorithms is that you can just run them forever, and you can just watch them. And they, they produce this bizarre behavior that uh, is, is simultaneously enthralling and, and befuddling. Uh, and and what's, what's really interesting is the fact that the system is able to sort of, given this scene, automatically come up with these, these solutions that are actually pretty hard even for humans to come up with, using its elbow, using its arm, using its wrist. Uh, and, and it just, just sort of keeps going. Uh, the block rotate. The gray block never rotates. The red block? The gray. The gray, the gray block. In this particular video, it doesn't. But I think it does in some others. So, so part of this also depends on the inertia of the object. right? Let me show you the, the real object in action. Right? So this is uh, implemented on the real system. Uh, you can notice that the object actually, yes, woohoo, it rotates. <laughs> I was like, that, that would be really bizarre if it was never able to rotate. <laughs> uh, so um, just sort of pushing your question a little bit further. Um, a lot of the assumptions depend on um, sort of essentially what the limit surface looks like, right? Um, and, and if you think about the way most everyday objects are, are designed, actually, if you take that coffee mug and if you look under it, uh, it won't make surface contact. It'll actually make a ring contact. Uh, this is either because the makers of that coffee mug know about quasi-static physics and have computed the optimal surface distribution such that uh, you know, the, the mug rotates the least when you push it or they just thought it was cool. Uh, but it turns out that you can actually optimize for the, the difference between the translational and rotational velocity of objects by manipulating the pressure distribution underneath. So is that true? Yeah, yeah see, I, I told you. Most of, most of our mugs are like that. It it's blows my mind. Um, but, uh, but it is kind of interesting. Uh, so um, does it work? Uh, the answer is sort of yes and yes, and maybe a little bit of no. Uh, the, um, of course, we make some very, very simplifying assumptions about how the world behaves. Uh, and when it works, it works really well. When it doesn't work, it just fails catastrophically. Like, that's, that's robots for you. Uh, and I want to dig a little bit deeper into sort of why it fails. Um, and it works on, like, all kinds of objects. So here's a case where these are objects that the robot can't even grasp, right? So if you only allowed it to grasp objects, it wouldn't be able to solve these problems, but it's able to sort of push these things around. Uh, this is a demo we did for Amazon to say that we could push their boxes around. But the system is able to do this sort of completely autonomously. Uh, what's really cool? is that we work with NASA uh, on their Mars rover. Uh, the Mars rover 
much like the mobipolator that I'm sure it was based on, uh, <laughs> uh, has no arms. Uh, and one of the things that NASA wanted us to do was to see if we could reconfigure terrain. Like, can we change the terrain that we're moving on such that when the robot, the rover encountered a large rock or a small rock, it would actually be able to push it and pull it and slide it instead of have to go all the way around it. Uh, and, and, and so we did that. Uh, this is uh, the rover running the, the exact same algorithm that we had running on HERB where the system is, we were told to sort of clear these uh, boxes, and it's able to use its entire body, right? We, we didn't tell it what part of its body to use, but it's using its entire body to reconfigure the, the terrain that's in front of it such that it can solve its problem. So this is, again, much like the Oreo. Uh, it was a shock to us, frankly, when it worked, because we had never designed this algorithm to ever do these things. And uh, of course, it was a, a Herculean effort by Jen to get all of this to work, uh, but it was, it was really rewarding to see an algorithm that we had never thought would work or never envisioned to work on, on such a domain actually working on it. So it was, it was pretty exciting for us. Uh, Here is another example of the robot doing some, so it's got two boxes over there and it's trying to move them. Of course, much of what it does makes no sense to me. Uh, it does end up doing what it's supposed to be doing. So. That's nice. This one's particularly interesting because it shows up and it's also interesting how it cradles the box sometimes between its, uh, um, between its wheels, almost like it has sort of fake hands. Uh, of course, as humans, we also tend to anthropomorphize everything. <laughs> so I pushed that thing out of the way and I was like, okay, that's great. But then it decided to bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> but then it used that to push the other one out of the way. So. Robot one, human zero. <laughs> so that, that's what happened. So this is, this is kind of fun because like, we, we really never thought it would work, honestly, and it, and it seemed to work really, really well. And so this is an ongoing collaboration uh, with NASA on this, on this particular topic. Um, so uh, criticisms of this algorithm, several, several criticisms. Um, one is that uh, we actually don't model uncertainty. You know, I started off motivating push grasping as saying, oh my god, this is such an awesome way to reduce uncertainty so that you can get the object in your hand. And then I said, oh, well, let's use our whole body. Let's use everything. And then we somehow forgot the fact that the whole original point of doing this was to reduce uncertainty. Uh, this is a terrible algorithm if you wanted to reduce uncertainty because it just keeps no track of uncertainty. So because we think that the world looks like this, Really, the world looks like this, right? It, it's like you have an immense amount of uncertainty in your objects, immense amount of uncertainty in your physics. And, and so we decided like, we needed to get back to that. We need, we need to be true to what we promised people we would do, which is reduce uncertainty. And so we, we have a new problem statement, which essentially, which is how do you push the object into your goal region with high probability, right? Let's embrace the fact that we have uncertainty in our system and let's try to push the goal object with high probability. We're still producing open loop plants. These are, and hopefully these are open loop stable plants. And, and this is actually some really wonderful work by Aaron uh, a couple of years ago on this concept of path divergence. Uh, so this is an overlay of six trajectories that are run on the same robot. So it's six trajectories overlaid on top of each other. We'll run it over and over again with the starting pose of the object slightly perturbed. And you can see how insensitive this particular trajectory is to perturbations, right? We had three of those objects just left behind where the other three were carried through. So clearly, this is a, uh, a, a trajectory that is not very sensitive to perturbations in sort of your initial conditions. And Aaron was able to show that we could actually connect this to some theory in nonlinear controls on what's called path divergence. So essentially, the idea is you have a nonlinear dynamical system. You have some perturbation. Let's say it's within an epsilon ball uh, of, of the initial conditions. And you'd like to show how that ball grows over time. Right? Ideally, you would like the ball to either stay still or shrink. Sadly, that often never happens. Uh, but you would like to be able to essentially look at the differential properties of the initial condition and try to predict some time steps into the future whether this uncertainty ball is either going to grow or shrink and in what directions it's going to grow or shrink. 
And so we call this path divergence. And, and we were actually able to produce a number uh, essentially based on the volume of the final uh, ellipsoid that you end up with, and the ratio of that with respect to the unit ball that you have. right? So that's one metric. If that volume is large, bad things are happening. If the volume is small, good things are happening. If the volume is less than one, awesome things are happening. right? Uh, and, and so that's, that's sort of the metric. right? You can come up with a path diversion metric. Here the metric is 12.4, which is uh, terrible. And you can have path divergences. You can play. Right? And so here's another trajectory which has low, relatively low path divergence. So we have the exact same initial conditions for the object as the previous trajectory, uh, but you can see how the hands act as funnels that are actually sort of converging the object into the hand. Right? So this is really exciting for us because it gave us a way to estimate the amount of uncertainty in a trajectory without actually having to do really, really expensive rollouts. Right? So a trivial way of estimating this uncertainty is to just roll out a bunch of trajectories with various initial conditions and then to estimate the posterior covariance. But that's very, very expensive. What we wanted to do was to just look at the differential motion and try to predict what the uncertainty would be. And, and so what we then did was essentially use this path divergence to prune out branches in our search tree. Essentially say, if your branch is going to increase divergence, don't do it. That's bad, right? Now, this actually worked pretty well in most cases. So this is sort of two different path divergences. It would say, don't use this and use that while you're enacting your search. And this worked pretty well. It actually worked better than the open loop strategy. And it was actually fairly efficient. But it also has a fundamental flaw, um, which was, and, and you know, we admitted it in our works, is that it's often uh, overly conservative. Right? Sometimes to reduce uncertainty, you've got to increase uncertainty. Right? So if you look at this, the, the, this bowl, for example, what's happening is that you initially start off with a fairly tight distribution, but you have to spread it out to even get to the blue box, right? So here's a case where you have to commit to increasing uncertainty even temporarily. This is a nonlinear, non-convex function that you're trying to optimize. Sometimes you have to go up so that you can find the next wonderful valley so that you can skate down, right? And path divergence in its sort of uh, exact nature of demanding you to always go down or mostly always go down. So you can implement some sort of uh, MCMC-like steps where you allow it to go up every once in a while, but it's still fundamentally restrictive in what it's allowing you to do. And so what we were able to do uh, was, this is again Jen's work, was to reformulate it as an unobservable Monte Carlo planning problem. Uh, so you're doing Monte Carlo tree search. The nice thing about it is that your branching factor is very small. Actually, it's two. Yeah, you, you just branch on your observation. And the observation is, I didn't see something, uh, because you're doing it completely open loop. So you can formulate this as a Monte Carlo tree search problem. And you can actually use some fairly efficient algorithms in MCTS. And knowing the fact that you've solved the open loop problem to actually come up with solutions where you're able to reduce uncertainty completely open loop. Um, the, the most uh, interesting factoid from this investigation is that observations actually hurt you. This is something really bizarre. Uh, in terms of the branching factor of your search, the more observations you have, the larger is your branching factor. So not having any observations actually allowed us to explore the search deeper, which made the problem easier. So this, is, this still puzzles me with PAMDPs. Uh, that, that's something that we're really excited about. Because what unobservable Monte Carlo planning allows you to do it allows you to generally increase or decrease or do whatever you want with uncertainty. Of course, we're relying very, very heavily on heuristics to help us guide the search, but that actually works, works really, really well. So what are the limitations of this work? Um, it doesn't use any sensing. Our robot looks at the world, this beautiful, complicated world with many objects, closes its eyes, plans, and waves its arms around, and opens its eyes again, hoping, just hoping that it has solved the problem. Right? Um, Oftentimes, that's a good hope. Uh, but you know, oftentimes, it leads to gorgeous, catastrophic failure. Right? Uh, even no matter how much you plan for the future, uh, the future is still a surprise. And it's always better to keep your eyes open uh, than to hope that you have covered every contingency. Right? Feedback is useful. And so uh, this led to um, a very long and very fruitful area of research for us uh, on just first trying to estimate uh, tactile state. So this is some really wonderful work by Mike Koval uh, on 
I have an object. I'm pushing the object. So it's, it's being pushed around with sort of non-prehensile physics. I'd like to know where it is from just my tactile data. So imagine you're reaching into a cupboard, and you're feeling around for the various objects in there, and you're trying to build a posterior estimate of what the world looks like based just on your contact data. Um, this turned out to be an incredibly hard problem. Uh, there's, there's sort of a lot of nuances to it, but essentially we had to invent uh, a new algorithm for sequential importance resampling. So if you use particle filters, then you end up with horrible particle starvation, and you have to do these nasty hacks. And we decided that we would do a, a more refined set of nasty hacks. Uh, and uh, we invented an algorithm that does particle filtering on essentially general Riemannian manifolds, uh, which is actually really, really nice and a, and, and a cool way to look at this problem. What this also enabled us to do uh, was, whoa. <laughs> I should also. Oh, you're coming to Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Don't send. How about we not send this report back to. Uh... I'm going to start this again. <laughs> Is it going to work? Um, let's go to slide. 50. Oh, not bad. How about just slide 60? Is that too much to ask? Uh huh. How about we go two slides ahead? If it crashes on the contact PalmDPs, I'm going to skip it. I'm just going to skip this slide. Anyway, we ran PalmDPs on manifolds. It was cool. <laughs> It was about two years of Mike's work, but whatevs. <laughs> it crashes my computer, so you know. <laughs> but thank you, Mike. Uh, so um, uh, not only did we uh, do all this stuff, write some cool papers, talk about Lipschitz constants and uh, things that, that we love talking about, but we actually uh, implemented all of these on, on sort of real physical systems. So this is uh, the DARPA. Uh, DRC, DARPA Robotics Challenge, that many of you probably are very familiar with. Uh, I get upset every time people show videos of the DRC robot like falling and, and breaking, because like many of us put a lot of infinite effort into this. So don't ever show a video of chimp falling. I'll come punch you in the face. <laughs> uh, uh, you're welcome to show this video. I'm happy to share this with you. Um, but uh, so, so this, is, um, this is actually particularly nerve wracking because uh, as many of you know, uh, the first day was full of navigation challenges and we did ridiculously poorly in those navigation challenges. I think we had zero points at the end of the first day. And then on the second day was the manipulation challenges and luckily we won 16 out of uh, the 18 points um, for the manipulation challenges and we did all right. But this is really uh, the system sort of working um, all completely um, autonomously. Of course, there's a user who's guiding it, giving it breadcrumbs, but the system is doing all of the planning that I talked about, doing all of the execution, and running it in a, in a fairly terrifying scenario where you have to uh, you know, do pretty well and win. So we had some, some good competition, uh, but we were able to do reasonably well. Um, it was also great fun you know, building robots. So we built Chimp from scratch, uh, and that was a, a fun robot to build, for sure. So um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of slides on manipulating with and around people. I told you I won't talk much about my HRI work. Uh, but really, one of the pr problems that I'm particularly excited about sort of moving forward are what we call sort of caregiving systems. Uh, this is collaborative work with a company called Kinova. They're based in Montreal. And we're working with them, as well as the Rehab Institute of Chicago, uh, to help people with high spinal cord injuries, so paraplegics, quadriplegics, uh, use robot arms that are mounted on powered wheelchairs uh, to perform complex manipulation tasks like, tasks, like pull something off of a fridge, try to shave. Uh, and this is particularly uh, exciting because it allows us to explore how we can do manipulation in the wild. Uh, for really, really hard problems in the real world. It is also particularly exciting as a human-robot collaboration paradigm but it, because it allows us to try and see how we can take really, really noisy input from humans and try to integrate that into goal inference. So from very, very small snippets of your motion, either with a head-mounted joystick or a sip-and-puff interface or a BCI interface, how can we predict posterior distributions on what you're trying to do and actually assist people? So I'm, I'm really, really excited to be working very closely with, with Kinova on this project. It's also pushed us really to think more about more from 
you know, move from autonomy to shared autonomy, about how robots and humans can actually work together to solve real problems. I want to show one video. This is uh, credit to Katharina, uh, who's here. This is uh, actual work with a BCI uh, uh, interface uh, with, with a patient at uh, UPMC. Uh, and this is work where we're comparing some of the shared autonomy algorithms that we're working on, actually, and Shervin, too. Thank you. Um, with respect to how easy it is to control compared to direct teleoperation. So this is actually really rewarding for us because not only are we able to develop sort of interesting algorithms and prove theorems about them, we actually have them implemented and working with the real target population who we want to work with. So that's something I'm, I'm really excited about moving forward. It's a particularly uh, interesting challenge for machine learning because you're getting really noisy data. And it's really, really hard to get large amounts of data, which a lot of sort of modern machine learning algorithms rely on. Getting even two or three minutes of data from a person with a high spinal cord injury is incredibly hard. Uh, their, their sort of data quality also degenerates quite um, uh, drastically with use. They get tired, they get nervous, they get anxious, uh, but they want the system to work. So this is one of the most sort of uh, rewarding as well as terrifying pro projects to be on because uh, we can actually hopefully really make a difference in, in real people's lives. Uh, one particular problem that I've been fascinated with recently uh, is feeding. Uh, when we spoke with, uh, and I'll tell you about some of the math of feeding very soon, uh, but uh, when we spoke with caregivers as well as patients, one of the top tasks that they said they would like to do is actually autonomously be able to eat. Uh, you know, being fed by somebody is something that uh, really changes the way uh, you live. And, and, and what we're trying to do is to enable people um, to to be able to feed by themselves. So here, what the system is doing is it's using its vision system to actually detect the food on the plate uh, using some grass planting algorithms to actually figure out what the right grasp is, where the broccoli is, how to stab it, and actually enacting that task. This is fully autonomous, but you can imagine a shared autonomy paradigm where it's actually working with the human so that you don't always just eat broccoli, uh, <laughs> which is what the system sort of tends to do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Manipulating food is actually a really fascinating problem. It's a deformable object uh, that we're trying to manipulate. Like when you try to like twirl spaghetti or scoop soup or, or do all the amazing things that you're doing with food, it's, it's particularly interesting and challenging. It also forces us to think beyond a very model-based paradigm. It's very, very hard to write math about how food moves when you push it. And so we're thinking about combining model-based and model-free algorithms to actually be able to manipulate food. The other point that actually my student Laura made, which is actually really, really interesting, is that um, eating, or at least eating socially, uh, is a, a social process, right? Um, hand, like, eating food is a handover from your fork to your mouth. But when you're eating in a group, and, and you should do this too, the next time you eat with a group of people, when you actually put your food in your mouth depends crucially on the setting that you're in. If someone's talking to you, you're not going to put your food in your mouth. If you're talking, of course, you're not going to put food in your mouth, unless you're my kids. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's just like, again, like I talked about, a delicate dance between engaging in a social dialogue and conversation and actually executing your primary task of you know, getting nourishment. And so if you have a robot that's just sort of stabbing broccoli and shoving it into your mouth <laughs> while you're having a conversation with your friends, you're not going to want to use that robot. So actually thinking about the timing of feeding, thinking about it as a hidden markup model where there's some latent state of when you actually want to feed somebody and learning that model is really, really critical in the acceptance of you know, feeding robots. So this is another piece of work that, that Laura has been working on. One particular piece of hardware that I'm really proud of is Fork. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is the world's most expensive fork. Uh, this is the same ATI Nano uh, Force Dark sensor that I used in my PhD thesis. So it's sort of, uh, and it's several thousands of dollars. Uh, and and so we we cut a fork in half and stuck the sensor on there. Why? Um, when you think about fee, because it's fun, of course. But when you think about uh, cutting food or when you cut into uh, you know, a piece of chicken, there's a very, very rich, forceful interaction that happens when you're interacting with it. Even if you want to tell the difference between stabbing sushi versus stabbing a grape, right? And we would like our robots to be able to learn this. Ideally, I'd like it to be able to learn this from just the proprioceptive data that it's getting from its arms, which is actually fairly good. But I'd like to be able to bootstrap this learning with sort of very high resolution four stock data that we're getting, right? Can we use this high resolution four stock data? This is a six axis four stock sensor, a pretty good resolution to 
bootstrap the way we can learn and to interact with, with food uh, while it's cutting or when you're performing these manipulation tasks. So we have some really nice preliminary results on this where you're using the force torque sensor to actually uh, both disambiguate between different pieces of food. So can you do tactile identification from the tactile signatures that different food items are leaving you? And then can you close the feedback loop on this to actually uh, be able to more effectively and efficiently sort of cut food and, 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 and do sort of bite acquisition? So this is a problem that I'm kind of really excited about. So I want to sort of close uh, uh, by saying that two things. One is, uh, you know, I, I work on manipulation with and around people. I'm really excited about it. And there's a lot of work more that needs to be done. I, I'm really uh, very passionate about getting robots to actually work with people. Uh, so, and, and I think robotics provides a wonderful opportunity to do that. Um, much of my work has really revolved around trying to formalize a lot of sort of very what to us as humans is very intuitive things, and formalize them in, in sort of mathematical notions that we can write theorems about, write algorithms about. And, and that's been, uh, it's a, I find it a very interesting and fruitful area of research. Um, and you know, manipulation is cool. Uh, I want to close with one thing. I, I, I came to work this morning, and I saw this. Uh, there's Rachel uh, at the end there. Um, we uh, were very, very excited to be working with uh, the next generation with kids, with students, we do, I think, more demos than most other labs. And we have an open lab, and I'm really excited and happy about it. And these kids had such interesting and wonderful questions to ask us, as well as ways in which they fearlessly teleoperated our robots that we're so terrified of. <laughs> I'm always impressed by how common people interact with my robots. You know, I stand like 10 meters away from it. Whereas my children just like, you know, jump on the robot. Like, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that um, we're really excited. Robotics is a great vehicle uh, to showcase algorithmic work because it tells you how you can take your algorithms and put them in the real world. It also gives you a window into how humans behave. Like I feel like I've learned more about myself when I've written my own algorithms. And I think we should really do more of that. Uh, there's, a, there's a letter that uh, uh, someone wrote to Vinita. Uh, I'm sorry, I put this out there. This is a, how old was this child? Uh, fourth grader. Fourth grader. And you know, very adorably misspelled all of our names. But she was most impressed with the fact that uh, Herb had a bow tie. Um, which is the only non-functional item on my robot. <laughs> like, everything else has a purpose except the bow tie. But you know, people love it. But I think being able to do the kind of outreach that we've been doing has been really rewarding for us. And, uh, and I hope you know, we can do more of that moving forward. And finally, uh, I want to thank my wonderful students, postdocs, staff, and everybody else that I work with. Um, it's been really exciting. Um, we've had. Um, 101 people go through my lab uh, since we started. Uh, and that's, that's particularly rewarding for us. Um, many people from different countries. Um, and, and that's something that I'm incredibly proud of. And I hope that uh, you know, I, I did you all justice in, in the time that I was here. And, and with that, I guess um, a new chapter begins. Um, thank you. No softballs. <laughs> it's okay. What would you have done differently, and what are you going to do differently? Oh, that's a, I, I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to say personal things. Okay, I'll say them, fine. Uh, I, I think that um, one of the things that I really enjoyed with my lab was the fact that we uh, worked on real problems, built real systems. Um, it's something that I, I would highly encourage among everybody. Uh, you know, work on real problems. Uh, even if you're worried about tenure or you're a young grad student, worried about how many papers you'll have. Uh, Mike and I often joke about how we put like Lipschitz constants in our papers, and then we ignore them completely when we implement them on our robots. <laughs> but uh, ignore them. Uh, um, I think what I would have done uh, differently, I think uh, two things. One, um, 
I think my narrative, you know, I, 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 I was literally a child when I came here, and I, I guess I've matured a little bit since. Um, I think earlier on in my career, I was um, a little bit more excited about um, writing papers uh, than about sort of sitting back and thinking and doing more fundamental work. I think this is true uh, for every professor and every student. You go through this in your career. And I wish I had sort of sat back a little bit more and thought a little bit more about um, you know, about, about what, what exactly to work on instead of sort of chasing the next deadline. Uh, it's, it's sad that as you get older, you get this insight. And I wish I could take back uh, half the papers that I wrote before. Uh, I have this like cringe whenever someone sends me an email saying, oh, I read this paper and it was interesting. I'm like, oh no, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure we all have that. Moving forward, um, I'm excited about, um, I, I spent all my life here. Uh, all my academic life here. I saw my first robot when I joined the Robotics Institute. I'd never seen a robot uh, growing up in India. Um, so I'm excited to move to a place where I can build a robotics program. I think that I've learned a lot of lessons uh, about doing that from here. Uh, and so I'm really excited about that from a sort of older professor point of view. Um, in terms of research, I think that um, I've always been focused on an application. Um, I've always been focused on manipulation. And, and I think that we've embraced any tool that's available to us to solve that problem. We've written algorithms, perception, navigation, written motor controllers as we're struggling through them. Um, and, and it's something that I, I really value. Um, so I think that uh, being true to the application, I, whenever I hear students tell me, I don't like technique X. I tell them, like, no, that's, that's the wrong attitude. You just solve the problem using whatever technique is available. Right? Don't, don't be drawn into ideological battles about what, what technique works or doesn't work. Just solve the problem right? and embrace any technique that works for it. Uh, and I think particularly from a personal point of view, uh, I'm excited about care. Um, I think we, um, we build a lot of systems. We produce a lot of artifacts that help able-bodied people be more able and lazy. Uh, and I think that whenever I work with patients uh, with high spinal cord injuries, many of them are kids, uh, about you know, teenagers who bungee jump or skydive and break their spine and cannot move anything below their neck. And, and it's very inspiring. It's terrifying to be working with them, but it's, it's very inspiring because you know, they're young enough to be my own children. And I, and I want to do something that can change their lives. So I think sort of a greater focus on sort of more fundamental work and also um, a commitment to changing, you know, it sounds too sort of uh, flaky, but like a commitment to actually changing people's lives in, in any tangible way that I can. And I'm excited about that. Other questions? Ready? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> sorry, too late. <laughs>